today's speaker, as they say, needs no introduction. Uh, Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia. He's written uh, a new essay called The Case for Courage. Uh, the blurb says, courage is not a feeling, courage is simply a decision to act, which seems appropriate in the current circumstances of Australian politics. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome him to address the press club. Thank you very much, um, Laura, and greetings uh, one and all. I begin by acknowledging the first Australians on whose lands we meet and whose cultures we celebrate as the oldest continuing cultures in human history. And thank you for the kind invitation to address the National Press Club and to launch this little book uh, I've just written entitled The Case for Courage. It deals with what I describe as the five mega challenges facing Australia's future, which I fear have been swept aside in recent years in what passes for our national political and policy debate. This book is one of a number being released this week it released this week as part of a new series by Monash University Press called In the National Interest, and I acknowledge Monash uh, for their commitment. Uh, when a colleague saw a copy of my book for the first time last week, uh, he quipped, I could never have written a book like this. And I said, why? Because it's not on China? He said, no, because it's so short. <laughs> And you, Kevin, never do short. You always do long, particularly when there's the possibility of writing yet another volume of War and Peace. My feelings were hurt, but I have survived. <clears throat> so I hope you enjoy a lightning read in our increasingly time-challenged world. Uh, friends, I've been back in Australia now for the last year. In fact, the longest time I've spent in our country uh, since I came second in the, in the 2013 national elections. <laughs> Abbott came first. The reason I've written this book is that for the first time in my life, I now have a genuine deep anxiety for Australia's future. This is unusual for me. By instinct, I am an optimist. But Australia is now facing the most profound challenges to our domestic and international circumstances since the Second World War. And it is the responsibility of this generation and what is still my generation to deal with these nation-breaking challenges as questions of real, measurable, substantive policy. Not superficiality, not as problems in issue management as has now become our national custom and not as political performance art, usually second rate. The time for political posturing, theatre and illusion has well and truly gone. And the time for action has come. Otherwise, we run the risk by mid-century uh, of becoming a second-rate country, one that fails to live up to uh, its possibilities and its potentiality, brought about by the corroding of our institutions, an exhausted economic model, and one woefully unprepared for the radical changes now unfolding around us. Today, I want to lay out three sets of challenges. First, the slow and steady decay of our critical national institutions. Second, the core economic, climate, equity, population, and national security challenges, which will determine whether our future is secure, sustainable, and prosperous, or the reverse. And third, how the national debate we need to have on each of the above continues to be diluted, diverted, and redirected through the sustained impact of the Murdoch media monopoly, as Murdoch continues to control the terms of our national conversation. The integrity of our parliament. Let me begin with the integrity of our national institutions starting with the national parliament itself. And here I must address the elephant in the room. Last year I decided to call uh, this little book The Case for Courage. I meant by that the courage necessary to deal with the deepest policy changes and challenges facing the nation. 
But what we have seen this year is courage of a much greater order of magnitude as women across our society have come forward to shed light on the predatory sexual behaviour of men. Indeed, we had one such voice at this very podium only last week in our Australian of the Year, Grace Tame. It is wrong that women should have to fear such behaviour in any place, let alone the parliament, which makes laws to protect all of us. It is wrong that female staff should fear being set upon by more senior male colleagues. It is wrong that young women should fear being sexually harassed or sexually bullied by male members of the parliament. It is wrong that any woman should fear being sexually harassed, assaulted or raped by ministers of the cabinet. And it is wrong that women of any age should fear this anywhere. It is not only wrong, it's unlawful. These are hard things to talk about. I know they are hard for women to talk about, particularly hard for women who are survivors. But talk about it we must. And beyond talk, we must act to change this toxic culture. Whatever Mr Morrison and his media minders may wish, it's clear the women of Australia rightfully will not stand idly by while men seek to push this under the carpet and the government encourages us simply to move on. Let me be plain. Sexual harassment and sexual assault in the parliament are an abuse of power, position and authority by my gender, the male gender, by men. It's not a problem caused by women or by the clothes they wear or by how much they've had to drink. It's a problem caused by men. I remember more than a decade ago then as Prime Minister stating that the responsibility for ending, ending violence against women in Australia lay with my gender, men. I thought back then that was an unremarkable statement, a simple statement of fact. I was told afterwards that it was the first time a national political leader had said it and that was before the men's groups around Australia erupted over my supposed crushing blow to their concept of national masculinity. There have been statements from brave young women across politics on this. Liberal, Labor and others. There are many others also brave who have chosen to remain silent. I have great respect for them all. I understand that talking about these matters is deeply disturbing for many women and I encourage you to speak with the many professional services that thankfully are now available to provide professional help and support. I welcome the fact that they will now be able to tell their stories to the National Sex Discrimination Commissioner. I would encourage the Commissioner to pull no punches in the report she produces and the recommendations she makes. I would also welcome all women who have experienced sexual harassment and assault from whichever political party to come forward and speak with the Commissioner. As for the political fallout for the parties, let the cards fall where they may. Now that I've said this, I'm sure my enemies in the Liberal Party, the Labor Party uh, and the Murdoch Party will be hard at work to find examples of harassment and assault among my staff during the period in which I was Prime Minister. The truth is, with dozens of ministers, with more than 100 members of Parliament and probably a thousand staff across the country, I cannot in all conscience state that there were no such cases. I simply do not know. What I can say is that across my period in office, I'm not aware of any complaint about my staff, my ministers or my members. And as for News Corporation, and before they resurrect my own drunken visit to a strip club in New York when I was a member of parliament, let me note that I was there at the guest of Rudolph, uh, Rupert Murdoch's right-hand man, Col Allen although I accepted and accept full responsibility for being there. My choice. Perhaps News Corp, which harboured such notorious sexual predators as Roger Ailes, will tell us whether they've used non-disclosure clauses to keep quiet allegations of sexual harassment and assault within their corporation. 
The Sex Discrimination Commissioner should be resourced to hold further inquiries across, for example, national media organisations and other parts of corporate Australia as necessary, where she considers it appropriate. Let the sunshine in. That's the way we begin to fix this. The uncomfortable truth for all Australian men is this. The game is now up. The age of male sexual entitlement is over. Australian women must be safe in all workplaces, led by the parliament itself. Failure to do so will leave a stench over the public standing of an institution which remains central to our democracy, the parliament. Beyond the parliament, many institutions are critical for the proper functioning of our democracy. Each of them is now under threat. First, the political parties themselves and the corrosive effect of unlimited corporate donations, as evidenced by Palmer's $83 million investment in the 2019 election in support of the Liberal and National Parties. Second, in the office of Prime Minister, whose standard approach is now to gag the most par basic parliamentary debates, stonewall any tough media question until the press gallery tires and moves on, and the unprecedented scale to which any remotely controversial question put to him in question time is referred to his ministers. John Howard had the guts to answer all the questions put to him. So did I, so did Gillard. No longer the case. Morrison is debasing the high office of Prime Minister in the name of media management. Third, the independent office of the Auditor General is being starved of funding despite the growing list of corruption, mismanagement and waste scandals. These include the $1.2 billion robo-debt disaster, the $2.5 billion community development grant scheme, the $100 million sports rorts program, the $30 million Leppington Triangle land transfer, the list goes on. With Australia sliding down the global corruption index prepared by Transparency International, the case for a strong federal ICAC is now overwhelming. Fourth, the collapsing independence of the Australian Public Service. My government restored the independence of the APS. We made zero political appointments to head government departments, restoring the best traditions of Westminster. And we retained all the departmental heads we inherited from the Howard government, all of them. Yet now we have a secretary at PMNC, the head of the public service, who is a long-term Liberal Party operative. The fish always rots from the head. As for the Australian Foreign Service, it becomes a job placement agency for a growing legion of failed Conservative politicians. Australian diplomacy deserves better. Fifth, the collapsing standards whereby retired ministers find loopholes to take lobbying jobs at the earliest opportunity. There is supposed to be an 18-month ban on lobbying by former ministers, but that didn't stop Christopher Pine being hired by property developers to lobby his state Liberal colleagues, and now his brief exclusion period is over, he's lobbying his former Department of Defence on behalf of a foreign arms manufacturer. And that's before we get to good old Andrew Robb. As Trade Minister, he encouraged state and territory governments to sell their assets to foreign investors. Then, just months after Morrison as treasurer allowed a Chinese firm to lease the port of Darwin for 90 year, 99 years, Rob took a job advising that company, not as a lobbyist, but as a consultant. These ministers may not have technically broken the rules, but it hardly inspires confidence. Six, the rolling assault on the ABC, its funding and the erosion of its independence. The coalition has cut $783 million from the ABC. Its real budget is now smaller than it was in 1996. News and current affairs often shoulder the burden, reducing scrutiny on government. Extraordinary political pressure has been applied to individual programs, such as Four Corners, over its coverage of sexual harassment in politics. And Morrison continues to ignore the independent nomination process for the ABC board that was introduced by legislation by my government. Finally, there is the greatest cancer of all on our democratic institutions, the Murdoch media monopoly. Greetings Boris and the team watching from Sydney. <clears throat> Murdoch controls 70% 
of Australia's print media, 100% virtually in Queensland, and Murdoch now has the biggest YouTube channel in the country. The biggest YouTube channel in the country. The truth that everybody knows, but very few say publicly, is that Murdoch long ago ceased to serve up credible political news. It's now a systematic protection racket for the Liberal and National Parties. And people are frightened of him. That's the truth of it. They're just frightened of him. Murdoch has viciously campaigned for the Liberal Party and against the Labor Party in 19 of the last 19 federal and state elections. That's not a statistical blip. That's what we call a trend. That's what we call a law. Not to mention between elections. They do this through the total conflation of news reporting and opinion. And they do so to advance Murdoch's business and ideological interests, lower tax for the wealthy, minimum re regulation and climate change denial. For Australia, there is a real risk that these seven factors that I have just run through are slowly driving our democracy into the dust. Each is like a crack in the wall. Insignificant at first, almost imperceptible. But then they start to coalesce. And when joined, they start to threaten the whole structure. For those of you who think this is fanciful or limited to Australia alone, I would commend Anne Applebaum's book, The Twilight of Democracy, which explores similar fault lines across the collective West. Australia's da daily media diet, dominated by the Murdoch media, also skews the parameters of our national policy conversation, the thrust of the argument contained in this little book. Across the economy, inequality, climate, geopolitics and pandemic management, Murdoch's relentless political and ideological drumbeat diverts our nation's attention from these core policy challenges. Let's look at our need to radically diversify our economy. For more than a decade, Murdoch's analytical frame for the future of the Australian economy has been summarised in two words, debt and deficit. Good governments had low debt and deficit, that's the Liberals. Bad governments borrowed, that's Labor. And then along came the COVID reality and a big dose of whoopsie on the part of News Corporation. Now, when I left office in 2013, net debt stood at $184 billion or 13% of GDP. By 2024, Net debt is projected to be seven times higher, a mind-boggling $1.3 trillion, or 59% of GDP. So what about budget deficits, which is Murdoch's other proclaimed essential measure of government's economic competence? In 2013, at the end of our term, our budget deficit stood at $30 billion, or 1.3% of GDP. This year, 2021, the Morrison government faces an eye-watering deficit of $222 billion, or 11.1% of GDP. Again, seven times the budget deficit under us. And that's after their eighth budget deficit in a row, having promised back in the 2013 election to get the budget back under control, and insisting, even after coronavirus emerged, that we, we would be back in black. By the way, because of early targeted and decisive fiscal intervention, Australia was the only major advanced economy to avoid recession during the global financial crisis. Whereas despite Morrison's spendathon, which came too late, we tumbled straight into recession. But how did the Murdoch media depict our successful approach to fiscal stimulus and its impact on debt, deficit and the economy? You guessed it. Here is just one of their many front pages proclaiming Labor's debt bomb. Really? Exhibit A. And what did the Murdoch boys say about Morrison's monster stimulus on their front page, the one that's seven times bigger in debt and deficit than ours? You guessed it, big bucks to bust COVID. With Frydenberg, a ghostbuster acting on behalf of us all. Bad labor, 
that is, with a debt and deficit one-seventh of the Liberal Party, good Liberals, when you have a debt and deficit seven times that of Labor in government. Exhibit B. I assume the Murdoch media and his coalition partner, the Morrison government, will be formally apologising for a decade of lies to the Australian people on debt and deficit. Perhaps their letter is still in the post. I've missed it so far. The bottom line is that Murdoch and Morrison have lied day after day, year after year, for a decade to get the Liberal Party elected and keep it in power on the strength of the debt and deficit debate. Let us finally inter this debate this day. It has also utterly distorted Australia's national economic debate for the last critical decade. What about the debate, critical for our future economy, on population? As you know, I have long argued for a big Australia of 50 million plus to fund our future national security, health, aged care and retirement income needs. You don't have to agree with me, but we need to have a focused national debate on it and to resolve it, especially now that immigration has collapsed. Where is the debate about our finally and fully joining the global technology revolution? With technology rewriting the rules of economic competition around the world, why aren't we inventing, innovating and commercialising our own breakthroughs at scale in IT and biotechnology and artificial intelligence, using our deep capital markets as established by three decades of compulsory superannuation? Why have our rates of R&D investment and research commercialisation plummeted when the rest of the OECD is headed north? Our failure to make Australia an essential part of the global technology revolution will turn us into a second tier economy faster than we think. Where is the debate on the future of Australian manufacturing, where Murdoch joined forces with Morrison's Conservatives in destroying Australia's car manufacturing industry? Did you know we are now ranked stone motherless last in the 36 member OECD in our level of manufacturing self-sufficiency? Stone motherless last. This is just reckless as the recent COVID crisis has demonstrated. Where is the debate about infrastructure given the combined Liberal Party Murdoch Party sabotage of the national broadband network abandoning fibre optic to the premises in favour of legacy copper? just in time to deliver us in COVID times among the worst internet speeds in the world? And where is the debate about an optimal tax structure for small business with tax incentives to become medium businesses and ultimately the new big global Australian brands? I don't see any such debate. Instead, we see an attempted tax grab by some in big business, the grafting of job keeper payments straight into profits and forensic tax minimisation schemes by major corporations like News Corp to virtually eliminate their tax obligations to the Australian people. Our big businesses need a reality check. Here we are, an advanced Western economy located in the fastest growing region in the world, which has already become the driver of the 21st century global economy, and only 8% of all ASX top 200 board members have spent two years at least two years, working in Asia. Only 1% of these board members actually speak an Asian language. We have become a self-congratulatory, self complacent, inward-looking economy whose political and in large parts corporate leadership have been squandering the enormous opportunities with which we are blessed in terms of the potential available to us all. The great global economic transformation now underway, the ownership of new disruptive technologies, the unprecedented wealth generation to which it gives rise, and the engine room of Asia's rise is passing us by. There are other mega policy challenges which I seek to address in this book. They deal with climate change and why we have delayed so long in becoming part of the global renewable energy transformation and why those opportunities are also passing us by. On equality, why we are not dealing with the growing income gap in our country. Do we wish to go down the path already pioneered by the Americans 
of a vastly accelerating Gini coefficient, which creates the feeding ground for the radical politics of the far right, and in time, the far left, to destroy the political center, which can drive long-term sustainable reform in any country. I also deal in this book with the challenge of geopolitics. I deal with the great global tipping points which arise as a consequence of China's emergence as the world's second largest economy and by decade's end, conceivably the world's largest economy. And I challenge the political establishment in this country to develop a coherent, long-term national China strategy to deal with these challenges. Not to simply mimic Trumpism, but to develop a strategy for ourselves which effectively balances our national security interests and our long-term economic interests. Instead, we have had a government which through its rhetorical self-indulgence, driven by domestic political imperatives, has decided that those political interests are best served by rhetorical flourishes against China, which have resulted in China designating Australia as public enemy number one. We may think that's unusual. Can I say it is unusual, given that every other American ally in Asia and Europe has exactly the same conflict and tension between its national security interests and its values on the one hand, and its economic interests with the largest and second largest and potentially the largest economy in the world. But only Australia, of all America's allies, has been singled out for the treatment that we now see. We need a credible, substantive, long-term China strategy. This again looms as a mega challenge for the future. And finally on pandemics, the fifth of the policy challenges I address in this short book. When we convened the 2020 summit back in 2008, envisaging the challenges which would be washing across our shores by this year, or this year just passed, one of the recommendations was that we needed to conduct national pandemic preparedness exercises. You will be surprised to know that later in 2008, we did that. We conducted Australia's first national pandemic preparedness exercise. I even vaguely remember it. I was Prime Minister at the time, amidst everything else. It's my melancholy duty to report to you that that was our last national pandemic uh, preparedness exercise. It was abandoned over the course of the last seven years. We started from scratch when we saw the outbreak which occurred uh, just on 12 months ago in our own shores. We need to do better than that because other pandemics will come. COVID-19 is not the last. To conclude, in the time which is available to me, what are the common denominators between these five mega challenges and changes that I've outlined in this book, The Case for Courage? First, in each of them, the economy, climate change denial, the assault on incomes, the China challenge, and future pandemic management, Murdoch has acted as Morrison's coalition partner, not as a source of independent scrutiny. Second, as part of this rolling protection racket, Murdoch has aided and abetted Morrison in skewing the national policy debate away from the genuinely big decisions we need to take to secure our nation's future. On the economy, we've had a bogus debate uh, about debt and deficit rather than a real debate about the future drivers of economic growth. On climate, a decade-long fear campaign about lost jobs and businesses from climate change action, rather than a real debate on the transition to the new jobs and new industries from a renewable energy future. On incomes, we see, for example, a campaign to kill compulsory superannuation by stealth uh, because of right-wing paranoia over industry funds, instead of a debate about decency in retirement and the fiscal consequences of increasing pressures on the age pension in the decades to come. Not to mention the question of using this great pool of national savings, which Paul Keating delivered to the nation's future, to build the national infrastructure we need for the future. On China, 
We've had a McCarthyist campaign against anybody who dares challenge the Morrison-Murdoch orthodoxy on China, rather than a debate about how to develop and manage a balanced China strategy that defends our interests and our values, given the challenge of an increasingly powerful and assertive China. And on pandemics, a politically driven campaign focused on dictator Dan down there in Victoria and the heartless Palaszczuk up there in Queensland, constraining personal freedom rather than developing the policies and mechanisms that will save lives and jobs now and in the future. The pattern in this is as follows. Everything right now seems to be about political management. Whether it's these mega challenges that I've just referred to or the avalanche of complaints now being raised by women around our parliament. Looking concerned with deeply furrowed brow at one level, while backgrounding ferociously against their critics at another less obvious level. That's the MO for the Morrison government. For Morrison, strip it all back, everything is still about partisan politics, media management, and the science of plausible deniability all in order to sustain himself in power, rather than an effort to identify the truth of what is unfolding and to take substantive action, either the matters most recently canvassed or on the great policy challenges for the future that I've referred to. And as for Murdoch, well, uh, it's all about power, money and ideology, and screw anybody and anything that gets in the road. And that's why Murdoch and Morrison work so well together. Their interests are complementary. And that is why this nation needs a royal commission into Murdoch's abuse of media monopoly. Together, they have stunted our growth as a nation, our security, and our economy. It's time to take them on. Our nation's future depends on it. I thank you. Thanks, Mr Rudd. Um, if I can go back to the first point uh, about national institutions and the current controversies, uh, we seem to have reached a bit of a stalemate on the question of what happens to Christian Porter and the role of Attorney General. If, uh, if we can take a step back from what you say is the Prime Minister's political management, what should be the test and what should be the framework in which this issue, which is unresolvable uh, for everybody involved in a criminal law sense, but what should be the test in a political sense and in terms of buttressing the, uh, buttressing the political and national institutions like Parliament and like uh, belief in government? Um, the accusations against uh, Christian Porter are serious, um, among the most serious that can be made. Therefore, they cannot be treated as any trivial matter. Um, I'm in no position to judge, nor is anybody else in this room, uh, Porter's uh, innocence or guilt. That evidence is not available to us. So the question arises, what then is to be done? So what are the options? One, uh, recourse, as it were, to the normal processes of the criminal law. Well, as we know, that's now exhausted. The police have indicated they cannot proceed with this investigation, not least because the principal witness is now deceased and by report at her own hand, tragically. The second option which has been canvassed is that of a coronial inquiry. We need to reflect carefully on the limitations that would arise from a coronial inquiry should that unfold. A coronial inquiry may, for example, investigate the question of the deceased's state of mind those factors impinging on that state of mind, uh, whether or not there are sufficient support services surrounding that person at that time. But they would deal with the fact of her state of mind as opposed to the question of whether the underpinning facts had any substantiation or not. So that leaves us with a third possibility. Uh, which is that of uh, an independent uh, judicial inquiry, short in duration, quite focused in its terms of reference. Um, I think um, the appropriate course of action under these circumstances is for that to occur, not least because what we are dealing with with Commonwealth Government Cabinet Ministers and not least the First Law Officer of the Commonwealth 
are a set of standards which are way above those which are simply determined by the criminal code. We are dealing with positions of state in this country which are uh, of the highest significance and therefore require people of uh, unimpeachable integrity. Therefore, the virtue of a judicial inquiry, limited in time, of defined terms of reference, is it gives an opportunity uh, for Mr Porter to answer for himself and for any others who have material evidence surrounding the accusations that have been made to also provide evidence and for such a person making the inquiry to draw their own conclusions independently. On the final point uh, associated with that, uh, the question will then arise as to whether uh, Mr Porter should remain as Attorney General during the prosecution of or the execution of such a judicial inquiry. Um, I think if I was Mr Porter in these circumstances, it would be wise to voluntarily step aside while that occurred. Uh, as to whether he should be compelled to do so is a separate matter. I'm very mindful of the fact that when accusations were made against Mr Shorten, who was Leader of the Opposition, uh, he did not stand aside from that position. Um, but then again, uh, that investigation was undertaken by the police and of course the person making the allegation was still alive. Uh, and it was tested along those lines. So I don't wish to be hypocritical, I don't wish to have double standards here and say that it was fine for Shorten to, be, to remain in position, uh, but it's uh, not fine for, um, for Porter to do so. But if I were Christian Porter, this would probably be the best opportunity to clear your name through such a judicial inquiry at arm's length, short duration, defined terms of reference. The next question is from David Crowe. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Mr Rudd. David Crowe from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. 25-year uh, veteran of journalism, 20 years at Fairfax, five years at News Corporation. So I'm going to ask you about I, the past and the future in relation to the I media. remember you at News. <laughs> I, every time you speak about um, uh, this issue, I, I, I think back to that period in early 2010 when I was working at the Financial Review. And I think, you know, you got a fair hearing from the media, by and large, at that time. And I remember waking up and seeing the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald reporting on your retreat on climate change and thinking that can't possibly be right. Uh, obviously it was. There was a failure of nerve within Labor on your leadership uh, within you know, months of that, of that move. And I can't help but ask, in your criticism of the Murdoch media and the media generally sometimes, is there an element of scapegoating there because Labor failed in 2010 on your leadership because I think it had a failure of nerve on climate change, on your leadership in general. Um, and that leads me to another aspect of the same question, which is, in the future, do you think, given your thesis about the media, it's possible for Labor to win an election? If so, how does Labor win an election with the media landscape as you see it? Well, that's like... Um Give me a quick tour of the future of the Western novel. <laughs> the, um, let me start with the second first, if it's okay, uh, David. Um, my argument is not against uh, Murdoch per se. My argument is always against monopoly. Monopoly is bad. None of you can look at me in the eye and say, someone who has 70% of the print readership owned in their corporation does not represent a monopoly. It does against any definition of monopoly available through Australian competition law. Of course, their counter case is, yes, but there are other media available. Well, the counterfactoid to that is one I've referred to in my speech today. Uh, Murdoch now has the biggest YouTube channel in the country. So whether it's traditional print or the content of print infiltrating its way into the electronics, because you know as well as I do, the radios, the televisions, every day they'll pick up what the newspapers are saying and, and it will frame a large part of the national conversation that day. And then you've got the direct intrusion into, um, into YouTube, which is why we have Sky After Dark, not just watched by that hardy band of 10,000 conspiracy theorists of an evening, um, as they all eat raw meat uh, with each other um, uh, and uh, drink. I won't say what they drink. And uh, uh, it now um, is being uh, punched out 
through Australia's largest uh, YouTube channel. So my argument, David, is about monopoly. The second point I'd say in response to your question is, um, I, did, I have not in my book, uh, which was a little thicker than this, uh, on my period as Prime Minister, uh, blamed the Murdochs uh, for my loss of the Prime Ministership. That's just not one of my accusations. Uh, they were certainly hypercritical, uh, but no, uh, this was a, an act by the factions of the Australian Labor Party, uh, in large part because um, they didn't see me as ultimately controllable. Um, and I think that is a matter of documentary record. And so my reflection actually ref in recent commentary on Murdoch has been what's evolved over the last 10 years. Prior to 2010, you know, Murdoch and his papers, two thirds of the time, they'd basically back the Conservatives. One third of the time, they would back the Labor Party, depending on where you were in the country. Since 2010, my friend, 19 out of 19. So I'm actually talking about a period in which, by and large, I haven't been in political office, apart from my return in 2013. Uh, the trend line has become much more acute, much more intense, and therefore requires some of us to speak out. And the reason so few of us speak out, and David, you know this as well as I, is that people are afraid. If you challenge the Murdoch beast head on in Australian public political life, they will come after you and take your head off because there is so much power and so much money at stake. Finally, in terms of the Labor Party's ability uh, to um, uh, prevail uh, at the next election, I think I would say this. With the Murdoch media monopoly uh, so intense, and very few of you in this room are from the People's Republic of Queensland. I am, okay? When you have every paper in the state, every paper in the state, with a very few local throwaway exceptions, um, uh, or some regional exceptions owned by Murdoch, it's nearly 100%. Frankly, the ability for Labor to win federally in Queensland is really difficult because it so much affects the local discourse uh, in Queensland about uh, federal politics. It really does. And so as a consequence, it makes it really hard to get there. Not impossible, just hard. If I can take some heart, however, if you campaign effectively and well, like Anastasia Palaszczuk did in the most recent state election, you can punch through. But by God, it's a fight every inch of the way because the media odds are stacked against you day after day after day. The next question is from Greg Brown, who um, is from the News Limited Empire, otherwise known as The Australian. <laughs> hey, where, where are the colleagues? There's usually a bunch of them. Hello, Mr Rudd. Um, uh, where are the colleagues? There's usually a bunch of them. <laughs> it's just me today. Good. Um, Welcome. So you said that your government is, was squeakly, squeaky clean, as far as you know, um, on allegations. I said what I said. Don't paraphrase me already. I said I cannot guarantee that was the yeah, case. Yeah, as far as you know. Yeah. No, no I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to verbal you or well, anything. Well, your like newspapers that. usually do, but go on. <laughs> um, but people are also concerned about the culture of Parliament House for it being an unkind workplace. And this is where you have a problem. Some of your colleagues... I was waiting for this to come, surprisingly, from News Corp. But go on, yes. Some of your colleagues were critical of the way you treated staff um, and the people around you when you were Prime Minister. And as well as... I presume that's why so many of them came back to work for me when I came back as Prime Minister. Well, quite a few of them quit too. Um, and there was... You've been accused of a concerted undermining of our first female Prime Minister when she ran during the 2010 election campaign. Did you write the question or did Boris... I wrote the question. Did your behaviour as a leader, in retrospect, fall short of appropriate workplace standards? Um, I think if you were to uh, interview uh, each of the uh, Cabinet colleagues at the time um, about uh, my leadership of the government, my leadership of the Cabinet, my leadership of my own staff, including my own staff, uh, and compare that against the leadership of previous Prime Ministers, I would come out reasonably OK. Um, and you know, none of us are perfect in this business, and I certainly am not. Um, but that is an entirely different matter uh, as to how we 
deal with uh, those questions in the past uh, to, frankly, the issues which give rise to this debate today. Your news organisation now runs, frankly, a campaign in parallel uh, to that of the Morrison government on the question of Christian Porter. Your news organisation says in that fairness, what, Mr. Rudd, what must prevail is the rule, what what you've had to say about the, murder the rule of law um, and that anything other than that is something uh, which fundamentally undermines the principles of the Magna Carta, Westminster and Runnymede on the Thames. And at the same time, uh, the Morrison uh, government argues that in fact what we have instead is trial by media. Morrison government saying trial by media, Murdoch media saying, um, saying rule of law. Now that's the narrative you two have agreed between yourselves. That's what happens every day in the media and your exercise today, frankly, is one to divert away from that. Every accusation made against me and my apprenticeship is taken head on in my own autobiography. It has one and a half thousand footnotes. I suggest you go to the footnotes, read them and interview the individuals uh, who have made those accusations in the past. I'm entirely relaxed about that record particularly when measured against uh, my predecessors, including Bob Hawke, including Paul Keating, including others, including Gough Whitlam, who have occupied the office of Prime Minister. But I really think you should reflect on your own monstrous double standards as a media organisation. Mr. <laughs> Mr Rudd, do, do you have regrets about the way you spoke to people and treated people? I mean, there were reports of Never a with female the Murdoch media. Flight, I've flight always attendant. thought to be direct and... Uh, and to the there point. was reports of a female flight attendant crying because you spoke to her so poorly. Well, can I say yeah, um, do that, you, do you regret that once, once again uh, represents a particular quality in Murdoch reporting at the time. If you bothered to read the uh, autobiography that I've written, uh, it actually goes through that particular accusation in detail. Have you read it? I've read your first book, but no, not no, the no. second one. Well, you're asking questions about my record in office. That book deals with my record in office. If you wish to challenge elements of it, you should have the professional standing and integrity as a working journalist, not simply as a Boris Whitaker operative or a Chris Dorr operative, to read the primary material first, but the, look, at the, wide, look at the footnotes and then say, this is accurate, that is inaccurate, this is accurate, that's inaccurate. But you're here to, in order to do a political job on me. That is what News Corporation does. You never go to the substance of the argument I'm making, which is, do you have a, a monopoly on print media in this country? Yes or no? Mr. Rudd, well, Greg Brown doesn't, so I think we can just sort of try to not personalise yeah. it here. Just on that point, uh, um, the Queensland point That's that the you issue at stake today, and what you folks never want to address, including in last week's Senate inquiry, was this question of monopoly. You will seek to divert the subject to anything that suits you, rather than address the central question, which is your abuse of the Murdoch media monopoly power. Just on that point, in, um, you mentioned the, the large owners that, that Rupert Murdoch owns a lot of newspapers in Queensland, but since you and Wayne Swan worked with Wayne Goss, Queensland wins at a state level, nearly, uh, Labor, sorry, wins at a state level in Queensland nearly every time. So isn't it that the po Labor's getting at the federal level the politics wrong, whereas at a state level it's been successful? Uh, the question here is whether you think, uh, sorry, not you, whether your uh, media proprietors who are watching this broadcast think that having 100% of the print media ownership in Queensland is a monopoly or not, and whether that's sustainable in any democracy. That's the issue at stake, not whether those within the democracy manage to work within it and try to compete as effectively as they can. As I said, each of your key lines and themes are those I've encountered in every press conference around the country, because they're served up by central casting uh, in Holt Street in Sydney, where the Murdoch beast has its um, pulsating heart. Um, I've, we've given a bit of extra latitude to um, Greg Brown because uh, the, there's been a lot of attacks on the Murdoch organisation, so I thought that was reasonable. Um, yeah, sure. Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review has the next question. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Um, hard act to follow, that one. Um, so I'm going to ask about something... No, Greg Brown enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> uh, He'll get brownie points back in Holt Street. I'm going to ask about something infinitely more simple, and that's relations with China. Um, you, you touched upon in your book about the need for a national strategy. I was just wondering if you could um, elaborate a bit on that for us today, particularly now we're, um, I guess, six weeks effectively into the Biden administration. We've just had the, uh, the, the Congress in, in China and things like that. Just a, I'd be interested in your assessment of where things are at the moment. And related to that, uh, the 
white paper that your government produced was the one that put in the, uh, the, the marker on the ground for 12 submarines. There's obviously a bit of interest around that at the moment. Just wondering if you still think that is um, the optimum amount of um, submarines that we need, particularly given the, the challenges that we're having with China. Good. Well, um, thank you for the question. On um, the future of the geopolitical challenges facing Australia, including the, the China challenge, it's real, it's big. Um, and whoever is occupying uh, political office in Canberra, this is an enduring national challenge of a large order of magnitude, which is why I've argued in this little book um, it shouldn't be trivialised into some sort of low-rent McCarthyite, McCarthyist debate like you see out of the pages of a news organisation whose name we will no longer mention. Uh, it's more complex than that. It really is more complex. Um, you refer to the 2009 Defence White Paper. We got into all sorts of trouble for producing that white paper at the time. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull accused me of being an old cold warrior um, and uh, returning to um, an ancient combative past. Our friends in Beijing did not like it at all because we explicitly stated in the white paper that China's new actions in the South China Sea warranted a public explanation from Beijing as to what China's long-term military and regional foreign policy strategy was. Now, the Chinese didn't like that at all. Um, and the truth is uh, that because we saw changes in China's strategic posture in the South China Sea at the time, we as a cabinet uh, security committee took a conclusion that we had to name it and then recommend a force structure for the ADF for the future. We recommended a doubling of the Australian submarine fleet, an increase of the Australian surface fleet by one third. Now, I stand by each of those recommendations uh, because it's an appropriate posture. Secondly, um, dovetailing another element of my book, that's why we need um, a new national population strategy for this country. Affording this country's long-term national security needs with one of the longest coastlines in the world, the third largest exclusive economic zone in the world, uh, with a population not much bigger than that of the Netherlands, is a hard ask. Yes, we have an alliance with the United States. Long may it prosper and continue. But when you have this rolling internal debate within America about which way they want to go long term, it behoves us to actually begin to take care much more fundamentally of our own indigenous long-term national security interests. It's one of the reasons why I advocated Big Australia. It's a bigger tax base to afford a bigger ADF to meet the defence demands of a very big continent because it's very tough to do it otherwise. So yes, uh, every line that is articulated there I would stand by. Appropriate then, even more so now. Thank you. The next question is from Pablo Vinales from SBS. Mr Rudd, Pablo Vinales, SBS World News. Um, can I ask you on climate change? Some progressives within Labor have taken comfort in Joe Biden's victory uh, last year, believing that it's a sign that voters, particularly in regional areas, are ready for a transition to renewable energy. Do you think that this coming election is a time for Labor to be bolder, as you say, to show courage? And if so, on climate change, I should say, and if so, does that at the very least require a medium-term target going to the next election? Yeah, uh, one of the reasons I've written this little book is that climate change action takes courage. Um, the previous uh, intervention from... Um, sorry, what was your name again? Pablo. No, Mr Brown, is it? First name? Greg Brown. Greg Brown. Uh, referred to uh, our decision in 2009 not to cancel the carbon pollution reduction scheme, as you inferred. Um, oh, sorry, it was David's. My apologies. David said, not to cancel the carbon pollution reduction scheme, but to defer it by two years. Uh, that's what we did. And, he, and uh, David was right that the internal pressures at the time, driven by the national political and media debate, were intense. We're also facing challenges in terms of what would happen in terms of um, uh, global action at the time. And that was the days of the Copenhagen Conference. We're now 10 years on. Um, so therefore, uh, I would encourage uh, the government, first and foremost, uh, to A, uh, adopt now a policy of um, mid-century 2050 carbon neutrality. Every other significant economy in the world, in the advanced economies, has done that. The United States has done that. The People's Republic of China have now moved to 2060. Japan has done 2050. Korea has done 2050. The European Union has done 2050. Uh, are we going to be dragged kicking and screaming into this? If we don't do it, we're also going to face very soon 
border adjustment taxes from the European Union against Australia for being climate change laggards imposed on our exports. Uh, the second thing we need to do is bring about a new nationally determined commitment for the 2030s, which has a carbon peaking date, uh, which, is in, which is well in advance of where it currently is. Um, now, the debate uh, among technicians is somewhere between 2025 and, 2020 and 2030. But there's a piece of mathematics here. If you go for a mid-century carbon uh, neutrality target of 2050, frankly, you've got to have a credible trajectory from where you peak at carbon in the 2020s in order to get to that by 2050. And all that is necessary to keep temperature increases globally within 1.5 degrees centigrade. It's all mathematics at the end of the day because science doesn't lie. So, in Australia, we need national courage to do both those things. The Liberal Party, who are currently the government of this country, need that courage. The global spotlight will be on them uh, when we get to uh, the Glasgow Conference of the Parties uh, this November. Uh, and the spotlight will be on all political parties to get behind the government doing that. We've got a few more questions. Uh, you, you're happy to go over time? Yeah, sure. OK, the next question is from Tom Lowry from the ABC. Thanks, Mr Rudd. Can I ask you to reflect briefly on Australia's response to the situation in Myanmar? The federal government only confirmed over the weekend it was formally sort of cutting military ties with Myanmar. Should Australia have acted sooner and what could the country do to actually create change and help return democracy to Myanmar? Uh, this is a uh, phenomenally complex subject. Um, through my work in the Asia Society, we work with um, the National League for Democracy, um, uh, the party of Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, and, um, and other political players in uh, Myanmar slash Burma. Um, and the military have acted against uh, Aung San Suu Kyi through the coup because, frankly, they feared losing power altogether and their hold on economic power and financial gain, which they have through their control of various uh, monopoly companies within the country. So, they're the underlying dynamics we actually need to understand. That's the reality that we're dealing with. So what can leverage the system back towards um, something which is more of a democratic future for Myanmar? Um, the truth is uh, the essence of the debate now lies on this. Will the maximisation of civil protest movement across Myanmar, not just in Yangon and Mandalay and in Naypyidaw, but elsewhere in the country, open up cracks within the Burmese military? Now, that is the actual debate that's underway in Myanmar at the moment. And so there is a game of um, nerves of steel at the moment between the military and the leaders of the protest movement on that essential question. What can the rest of us do, given that that's the essential internal reality? Uh, the rest of us need to maximise our support at a political and diplomatic level, uh, which um, uh, makes it plain that we in no way are legitimising uh, the new uh, military regime in uh, Yangon, in Naypyidaw. Uh, that's why I think the um, Foreign Minister's statement about the cessation of, of assistance regime to the Burmese military is correct. Should have been done earlier. Look, to be fair to Foreign Minister Payne, these are difficult and complex questions on the ground. I assume they've tried to use whatever contacts we have with the Burmese military to put messages through about a return to democracy. Um, I don't uh, discount the importance of that, but I do think it's important where they have finally moved. So I make no criticism of them. Annabel Hennessy from the West Australian. Uh, hi, Mr Rudd. Annabel Hennessy from the West Australian. Thank you for your address today. Um, You've recently criticised media treatment of Julia Gillard from when she was um, PM. Um, as we all know, Miss Gillard had criticised you in the ABC's killing season. She described a bullying encounter in 2007 where she said you acted in a menacing and angry way after a 2007 tactics meeting. Given the discussion we're having now about the treatment of women in politics and also with the benefit of time, do you have any regrets regarding your relationship with Miss Gillard from when you were both um, MPs? Oh, this was a highly combative and political relationship between uh, Julia Gillard and myself. Uh, the incident that you referred to, if you've read um, the uh, volume two of my own autobiography, I explicitly address, I reject. Uh, there is no evidence to substantiate it whatsoever. If it were repeated today, it would um, trigger me to take defamation action. Okay. Okay. We're unsure. Yeah. 
Uh, Matt Johnson from uh, Year 11. The reason I didn't take it then is I, didn't, I wasn't made aware of it within the statutory period. Matt Johnson from Year 11 at Canberra Grammar School has a question. Uh, hi, my name is Matt Johnson. I'm a Year 11 student in Canberra Grammar School. Uh, before I start, I am my table back there, and I'm sure everyone else who is watching, I would like to thank you for the frankly riveting game of handball that you played with our principal last year. Um, and my question is as follows. He was not very good. <laughs> yeah, crushed it. You guys were good, but you know. Um, good. Recently, we, we do handball training camps. We just need to uh, uh, raise the money for the National Apology Foundation. <laughs> Recently, particularly in the US, uh, we have seen what can be generously described as a breakdown in relations between the left and right. Uh, the idea of how the COVID-19 pandemic and vaccines should be handled, lockdown versus personal rights and freedoms, election security and all manner of other conflicts. And, and what's interesting about these is they're all based on a divergence in opinions about what is true and what is false. My question to you today is, what do you see as the cause of these? Uh, the, the my fiction is your fact conflicts, and how can I, as a, how can I, as a young Australian, avoid falling victim to them? Yeah, thanks for the question, because it's, it's, it's a really important one. It goes to the fabric of the democracy. And uh, what a democracy is based on? Free press, uh, a media which uh, fearlessly reports fact and quarantines fact from its own editorial opinion, hence my critique of Murdoch. Um, and if we think this is just a problem at the margins, what we've seen in America through uh, Murdoch's Fox News over 30 years is the slow and steady creation of this ecosystem where facts are invented to the point where we can then talk about alternative facts, which is where we got to during the most recent Trump presidency. Now, I come from an old fashioned school which says that facts are something which are called empirical. That is, you establish through evidence that a fact exists. Um, and other than that, it's an opinion. Uh, the, the method by which we then operate with our facts is through another convention called reason. We use reason to marshal facts to form a conclusion. Uh, this is such an essential, almost unspoken of part of our democratic life. But what I find increasingly uh, through um, uh, what uh, Murdoch's Fox News has done in America is create this ecosystem of non-fact of, of uh, alternative facts, of, of opinion only, to the point that opinion and fact are conflated, which in fact is what Murdoch seeks to do more generally in his print media. And you also see this parallel phenomenon uh, emerging now in uh, a lot of branches of the social media. So what can we do about it, which is the heart of your question? Because left unaddressed, what it does is render our democracy somewhat ungovernable. Uh, that's the problem for us all. How can you fashion compromise with the institution up on the hill here if we're all operating off different, quote, fact bases? I mean, uh, we can all have different opinions about the same body of facts, but if we're operating on different facts, um, then let me tell you, it becomes chaotically ungovernable. I think the beginning of the rollback against all this is simply to say no to the abuse of monopolies uh, that actually have this as their standard craft. Uh, to uh, when we see it in social media, for example, whether it's uh, Twitter or Facebook, to roll back and to complain uh, to, the, um, uh, to their own corporate regulators about the abuse of fact uh, in their own uh, Twitter and Facebook streams. But similarly, um, in the Australian media as well, whether it's through the Toothless Tiger, otherwise called the Australian Press Council, which usually take a year or two to resolve matters that I put to them, um, that this was not a fact, uh, and here's the evidence, and then they'll think about it for two years, and then they may arrive at a conclusion, maybe. But all I'd say is um, the key thing is to ensure that we have in our national media institutions a code of conduct, code of ethics, guidelines for our national uh, profession of journalism, which is properly policed by the profession itself which asserts constantly the centrality of fact and evidence as a basis for fact, which is why you print it and publish it in the first place. That's the confidence that the rest of us need to have in what the media has produced. But when you see this stuff, as I said, seven times more debt produces that, seven times less debt produces that, liberal labor, conflation of fact and opinion, that's why people cease to believe. And if you cease to believe all that's then presented to you in the media, the mass media, the very basis of, let's call it, 
an information base to construct our future political arrangements becomes more fragile. That's why America is in trouble. We're here to make this the last question because we're wildly over. Nick Stewart from the Canberra Times. Thanks very much, Mr Rudd. Um, you referred to China in response to Andrew Tillett's question. Looking at China and our relationship, what are two simple things that we could actually do to get that back on track? Speak less and do more. <laughs> that's, that's a perfect uh, rounding up of the day, really. Um, so <laughs> please join me in thanking Kevin Rudd.